Hey everyone, Dr. Lee Thomas here. Um, we've got a great show coming to you guys today. I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Lindsay Dalton. Um, the show that we're going to cover today, uh, she's a, a doctor of pharmacy, uh, so she's a wellness pharmacist. And what we're going to cover on the show today is basically if you have any problems with taking medications or if you've ever wondered, like, why is my doctor making me take this? Or, you know, I'm taking multiple medications and maybe having interactions with those. You know, what we wanted to essentially work on breaking down for you today is the title of the show is when your drug may be your problem. You know, having practiced for eight years, and we've talked about this a lot, I get patients who come in who are on tons of medications, some of them from different doctors. Some of the people don't even know the doctors, like the doctors don't talk to each other when they prescribe them. And so I've seen a lot of patients where I literally just run a, you know, like a basic drug interaction checker online, and I find that they have severe interactions from just taking these medications. And so my hope is that on the show today, we can cover that, really give people great resources, obviously have your information available as well. So if people are listening and they want to work with you or they have more questions, they're going to know where to find us and where to start working on really building their health naturally and obviously living a life in wellness, which is what we're all about. So totally. um, without further ado, this is uh, Lindsay Dalton, who's a wellness pharmacist. She graduated from Ohio Northern in 2010. Um, I have a question. So I know that she worked uh, in, in retail pharmacy and pharmacy for a while. And now I know that you're you're paving this new path where you're a wellness pharmacist, consulting with people, educating them on their medications, you know, what they need, what they don't, um, you know, how to manage those properly and make sure that they're not having those interactions or just getting to the cause and getting healthier. Mm -hmm. What made you go into this, uh, into this niche? Basically, since I've been practicing for 10 years now, retail yep. pharmacy, I see a lot of patients. I've seen hundreds of patients. And I noticed over the 10 years, the ages of the patients picking up prescriptions for hypertension, high cholesterol, the ages started to decrease until oh, yeah. people my age in their mid thirties are yeah. picking up prescriptions for high blood pressure oh. and diabetes and high cholesterol. And it just, it doesn't make sense. I kept asking myself, why, why are the patients getting younger and younger? Yeah. It yeah. just didn't make like sense. Sicker and sicker. At the yeah. Age. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we were taught in school, you know, basically you get older and you just get hypertension yeah, and it it's happens. like we learned about the disease and the drugs to treat the disease yeah and it's kind of embarrassing but i never asked like well why why are, do they all of a sudden just have hypertension why do they all of a sudden just have high cholesterol right like i never asked why and there's reasons why yeah yeah, absolutely. I think that's I think that's incredible. I, I was reading a study the other day. So this was from Blue Cross Blue Shield, and they actually put up put this out, and they said, "What is the actual peak now of human health in ages?" From what they see, I don't know if you saw this study, but they said that 27 years of age is the year that we max out. Like they're saying, after 27, our healthcare expend our healthcare expenses go up year after year after year, and our problems get bigger and bigger and bigger. Like you're saying, like why are people coming in, in their mid 30s on blood pressure medications? Mm -hmm. So I mean. I know you've been around, I know you see people. What do you think are the main reasons why people are getting sicker and sicker at a younger age, taking these medications at a younger age? The foods that we eat, mm -hmm. I really blame sugar, processed foods, mm -hmm. the um, the high carb, low fat era in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. I think that just destroyed, that destroyed us because all these companies started coming out with all these processed foods that I grew up on mm -hmm. and people think that that's what you're supposed to eat. They're, yeah. they're not educated on how to eat well. There's toxins in our lives and our products that hinder our bodies from detoxing naturally, build up yep. of those products. Um, our, our minds, our mindset, stress, lack of sleep mm -hmm. has so much to do with it. Yeah, totally. And so one of the things that like, so this is what I learned going to school because I, obviously I've been in wellness the whole time. And all of my friends are pharmacists, like my, my groomsmen all the way down were either chiropractors or pharmacists I me mean, all the way down. So like, it's funny because we, in school, we, we actually, we argued a lot on concepts of wellness and health. And a lot of them, when they were in school and learning it, they were saying, no, man, we need medications. We need these things. And now it's funny now that they're out, most of my friends who we argued in school were now in this right mind of thinking thinking of like, what, where the heck is our health going as a nation right now? We are the most medicated. We take more medications per capita than any other country in the world. We lead the world in number of medications taken overall, yet we're 5% of the world's population. And if those worked, I wouldn't complain, but we we're, we're the sickest industrialized nation in the world. As far as our first world country is concerned, 
We're 50th in longevity. We lead the world in chronic disease, which I know we're going to talk about. And, um, you know, for me, I think, you know, when people go to doctors, um, you know, I don't think they get educated on health. What are your thoughts on no, that? No, I don't think they do. I didn't. And it's crazy. We, we were taught first-line therapy for all of these chronic conditions, lifestyle change. Were we ever taught about lifestyle change? No. Were doctors oh. ever taught about lifestyle change? I've heard tons of doctors say no. Doctors don't know anything about nutrition. Mm -hmm. Doctors hardly know anything about drugs. Yeah. 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 That's a, that's a scary thing too that I want to get into. Um, but before that, because we see the drug commercials on, on TV mm -hmm. when they say like, well, when they say, sometimes they say it, I, don't, I haven't heard it recently, but they'll say like, when diet, exercise and lifestyle change don't work, this drug can help. And I'm like, well, you know, what research shows, and there was a big journal um, of pharmaceutical research that showed that 90 to 95% of all cancers are caused by environmental factors. So there's only maybe five to 10% that have a genetic component that you may end up triggering on and at some point in your life, but that the vast majority are actually lifestyle induced. So the way that I like to think about it is, well, you know, diet, exercise, and lifestyle change, getting adjusted, eating well, taking care of your posture and your spine, managing stress, detoxing, those never don't work. Very, very rarely. You know what I mean? So I think we're we're just kind of brushing that whole lifestyle thing, you know, under the rug and saying, well, did you try to eat healthier? Yeah. I mean, I skipped breakfast once and I worked out <laughs> yesterday and I, I still have diabetes. Okay. Well, then just take this medication or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so the second thing you said there was um, – we, we talked to you said that they, they're not educated, but then the second thing was they, they hardly know anything about drugs. They hardly know anything about them. Talk about that. So I, I, I know this, that when I see patients now, they're coming in with medications and A, I have trouble pronouncing the names, but I've never heard of them before. And there's more and more and more of them. And, and I'm, I'm like, I struggle to keep up and I see patients, we, we take care of probably a hundred new individual human being people who come into our office a month. And now I'm seeing medications that I've never even heard of before. Why do doctors know so little about the drugs that they're prescribing? That's not what their niche is, I guess. Their niche is diagnosis okay. and then treatment, but they're only told like what drugs to give and what the classes are. They don't know how these drugs work. They don't know how these drugs are metabol metabolized. Okay. That's not what they're trained in. That's what we're trained in. Right. So there can be these interactions with, you know, liver enzymes and they, they have no idea. Yeah. So let's say that like they're seeing their, their cardiologist, but they're also seeing the general doctor mm -hmm. and they're prescribing different medications. Are those two doctors ever talking to each other just saying, hey, I'm giving him this, you're giving him that, you know, right now this patient's on six medications, four, eight, ten. Are, are doctors ever talking behind the scenes and saying that? Or is that really like you and when, when they come in maybe to get a prescription filled and you're like, hold the phone, like, what are you doing? Yeah, they rarely talk to each other because doctors don't have time. Yeah. I mean, they're seeing patient after patient day in and day out. They might get a fax from the other practitioner that mm -hmm. a nurse glances at and might put in the chart, but no, they're not talking to each other. Okay. okay. And so, so what are, so from, from what I've read, it's, it's anytime that you take a medication, it's not, it's not just what the drug does to your body. It's what your body can do to the drug. And it's also how different, you know, we're talking synthesized manufactured medications mm -hmm. that are, that are in your body for a long period of time. What I've always heard of there's, there's, there's drug drug interactions that can happen. And is it true that when you take, more medications, those interactions can like increase. Like if oh. you take more than two, more than three, more than four, you can start running, like making new compounds in your body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because your liver is breaking down these drugs and they're becoming metabolites. Those metabolites can then interact with one of the other drugs or mm -hmm. metabolites can interact with metabolites. Okay, wow. And I mean, they can cause harm even to your liver and then nothing is getting metabolized correctly. And then that's what happens when you take a statin for high cholesterol mm -hmm. and it just builds up and up and up and then you end up with serious muscle damage. Yeah. Can we talk about statins? Because I think that if anyone's listening right now, statistically speaking, there's probably 10 to 15 to 20% of them that are taking a statin just from sure. people listening right now. Um, yeah. Talk about statins for a minute because I think they're, they're one of the most prescribed medications in America. And I, I've read a lot on them in, in benefits and risks. You talked about muscle wasting as a potential. I've read about cognitive issues, um, you know, lack of cholesterol production in the brain. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about it for a second? Because a lot of times when I see people, 
it's not this short-term medication. They're, they get on it. And, and I had a lot of patients ask the doctor, hey, when do I get off of this? And they said, never. You're going to be on this for the rest of your life. Can you talk about maybe some of the potential dangers of statin medications, especially if someone's never had a heart attack before? Yes. So my, <laughs> my, my mom was put on Simvastatin. It's been years ago now. And at the time, she was not eating well. She was probably having like a small bowl of ice cream every single night. Okay. And her cholesterol came back slightly elevated. So her doctor put her on a low dose uh, cholesterol medication, simvastatin. Okay. And that was years ago. And I was just with her last week and I asked her, I was like, are you still taking that medication? And she said, yes. And I said, stop taking it, please. Yeah. She has changed her diet. Okay. She walks like five miles a day. So she's getting outside. So she's getting yeah. ready to Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no reason. And I just read some research saying, like you had mentioned, long-term statin use is going to decrease cholesterol. Obviously, that's what it's for. But we need cholesterol. Yeah. We need cholesterol for healthy brains. Yeah. There is an association with low cholesterol and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and yeah. dementia. Yeah. I mean, we're going to all end up with dementia and Alzheimer's eventually if we keep going the way we're going and everyone gets on a statin yeah, yeah. there i mean there are like you said there it's not just people who have had heart attacks it's for prevention right let's just eat a couple more salads like yeah. mean, we need cholesterol yeah it's great that you're saying that because i say that all the time but i feel like you have the actual resources and yeah education to say it. i just read research and, and see that uh, the british medical journal came up with a study in 2016 that said that there's an inverse ratio to having high LDL cholesterol and death, meaning the higher your LDL cholesterol is, the lower your risk of actually having mortality. And the funny thing about that is people typically look at LDL cholesterol and they say, well, that's the bad, that's the bad cholesterol. And what we're finding now is there's not necessarily good or bad cholesterol, but it's all necessary. The, the real culprit is inflammation. Mm -hmm. You can lower the cholesterol all you want. If you have inflammation in your body, you're still gonna be sick. And so what are we doing? We're taking someone who has a highly inflammatory diet and lifestyle and we're saying, well, let's just try to drop your cholesterol because you're so inflamed that your body essentially is, is oxidizing that cholesterol so fast that you can't keep up with it and you might die. And then you look at the research for people who haven't had a heart attack yet. And I've read that there's some benefit if you've had one that it can re reduce your risk for having a second one, but the number needed to treat, the number of people who need to take a statin medication have a net benefit is more than one in 200 if you haven't had a heart attack. And the risk of all these other problems, especially long-term, you know, if you have, let's say, your cholesterol jumped, uh, jumped up to 400, you might want to take it for a minute or two and then, like, find the cause and fix it. What are your thoughts on that? Like, Definitely. Does it have to be for the rest of your life or should there be an end point where you try to get off of it? Because we get patients' cholesterol balanced, and then all of a sudden they go back to their doctor like, hey, my cholesterol is amazing. I've lost 50 pounds. My body fat percentage has dropped 20 points. My posture is better. I don't have headaches. I don't have migraines anymore. My blood pressure is balanced. And they look at them and they say, well, you can't stop taking your statin medication. It's like, well, I'm healthier in every single aspect. But you're saying now that I have to take it because of my, my cholesterol. That's not even a problem now. Yeah. These medications are, are Band-Aids. They're not solving the real problem, the root cause. Okay. That's what doctors are doing. They come in, have a patient with high cholesterol or hypertension, yeah. and they're slapping a Band-Aid on the mm -hmm. issue. Yeah. There is a deeper root cause for why our bodies have high cholesterol or why our bodies have increased the blood pressure. And a lot of times, like you said, it is due to inflammation. Yeah. You yeah. just have to take the time and be willing to put in the work to find that root cause and fix it. Awesome. Awesome. So, so whenever you're, cause you do consulting work now and you're working directly with patients as, you know, as a portal of entry, as, a, as a, a consultant. So whenever you're working with them, what are the most common like problems and issues that you see with people? Um, is it they don't know where to start? Is it you know they just are confused with everything that's going on in their life? Have they failed a lifestyle change or they never even taught that that's not a possibility? Yeah, I think people are definitely confused, especially when it comes to diet. Because I think there's so many fad diets out there mm -hmm. and there's just so many options that you can go to. Um, that they just don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. Yeah. So they just don't. <laughs> yeah. I get um, it. Paralysis, finally, he's just like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, my best advice to them is just eat real food. Bottom line. If you turn the package over and you're looking at the ingredients and you're like, what is that? Yeah. Don't eat yeah. it. Yeah. If you can't spell it, it's made in a lab. 
It's fine. I'm good for you. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so changing their diet is one thing. Um, whenever you consult with them, are you able to help them actually figure out where they have interaction problems and have them actually be able to talk to their doctor and say, Hey, like we just found this problem here, this problem there. Cause there's always this thing where if you didn't prescribe it to them, you can't take them off. But same thing for me. Mm -hmm. I have patients come in that I like, I want to chomp at the bit to say some things that legally speaking, not being their attending physician who prescribed the medication, I can't just say, oh, that's, you can't do that. You know what I mean? So how do you navigate those waters with helping someone who has, you know, three different doctors prescribing the medications or four or specialists? How do you deal with navigate those waters with helping them really get down to the root cause of these things? Because changing lifestyle is one, but if someone's on, you know, a lot of different medications, how do you work with that? Yeah, definitely. So if, in Ohio, pharmacists are not allowed to prescribe or, um, Deprescribe basically. Can they anywhere in the U.S.? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. If I know they in like can. Latin American countries, they are like they, they can do, do everything. All. And my my Spanish teacher in school was like, "That's why you want to get medications if you're there because they know what they're giving you." But my, my Spanish teacher in high school used to say that. And I was like, "Well, what is she talking about?" Now that I'm more like, I know exactly what she was talking about. Yeah, because we have an issue here. Yep. There's a lot of advocacy for pharmacists being recognized as providers, but we're just not there yet. Okay. Um, so when we do have a serious interaction or someone is really um, considering stopping one of their medications, I do reach out to their physician. Um, as a pharmacist, that's my job. Um, right. So I do reach out uh, usually either talk to a nurse leave a message and it's up to them to respond and get back to me so I always make sure to let the patient know you know next time you're in and you also want to bring it up to your physician because you're going to be right there with them right right and that's sometimes a hard thing is I feel like there's this intimidation factor mm -hmm. I feel like patients oftentimes they're scared that if they speak up to their doctor and tell them like I don't want to take this anymore or you know can you take me off of this I think patients are afraid they're going to be like dismissed. Like they're going to, oh, you're insubordinate. You're not following your actions. Get out of my office. I've had a lot of patients say that. So, um, so what do you think is the best way that they can can advocate for themselves, or in an, a in an intelligent way? B totally sidetracking here, going back a little bit. Do you get good feedback from doctors too? Like whenever you talk to them, do you get people who are like eager to to learn more, or are they just like meh? Like what were your thoughts on this? Yeah, Sorry, no, this they're yeah. not usually they're not usually willing to learn. That's no, right. well, and most of the time I'm hearing back from the nurse. Mm -hmm. I'm usually not hearing back from the actual doctor. Okay, so I mean that's tough too because yeah. you never really yeah. get to talk to the man, the person, the actual <laughs> the yeah, I get it, or the woman. Yeah, or, <laughs> yeah. No, I it's uh, that, I think that's crazy. So um, where do I want to go here? I've got so many questions to ask you because I'm so excited because like this is just a, such a fun conversation for me. But um, yeah, so let's say that um, let's say that someone has like some interaction problems. Um, do you are you able to basically counsel them on like if they wanted to stop these? This is what they have to tell their doctor, or like this is what they need to do in their lifestyle. Like for example, let's say that you know a lot of people take statin medications come into my office. They have a CoQ10 deficiency mm -hmm. right off the bat. And I'd say probably 90% of the patients that I see who are on a statin medication, they don't know that. You know, they don't know that other medications can strip their body of B vitamins or minerals or other nutrients like that. Um, are you able to help them understand that better? Because medications do take away from a lot, a lot of the minerals and absorption rates in our body. They interfere with a lot of, you know, biochemical and neurological processes. What do you, what's your background in helping people with those specific things as well? Absolutely. I always lead with lifestyle. Okay. So I would review a patient's medications and then go down the list. And first and foremost, think of nutrient depletions, okay. oral contraceptives, deplete vitamin B6, um, metformin wrecks the gut. Absolutely. Okay. Depletes vitamin B12. These are crucial vitamins that our bodies need to metabolize drugs, to make neurotransmitters. So that right there is part of the problem. Yeah. Unfortunately, these drugs are part of the problem. Yeah. yeah. So I always lead with lifestyle education. The, the point of this whole thing 
is to educate people, inspire them to want to change and empower them to feel like they can do it themselves yeah. and not have to rely on the doctor right. to slap a Band-Aid on them every time they need one. Right, right. Because you're not going to get the, the nutrition diet lifestyle. I mean, I, that's part of the reason we started our practice was the same thing was there's no one teaching this stuff. You know, we teach our essentials and, our, and, and help people with that. They're not getting it anywhere else. They're getting the whole... Yeah, lifestyle change didn't work. You tried to eat healthy for a couple of weeks. You ate a salad once, and you know what I mean. And they're just not getting that that information through there. Do you have a website too that people can go to? Because I want for my patients or anyone listening in to know, like, if they need to contact you, if they want help with this. This is something that we've I, I've been wishing for in my life for a long time. And so um, when Dr. Lindsay came in and she said, "Hey, I'm starting this new endeavor. I'm going to be a consultant to actually help people understand their medications, understand interactions." It happened when I was talking to her about a patient of mine who's been taking a, an SSRI, an antidepressant, for 15 years and has failed time and time again to get off of it. She's wanting to, and she said, hey, let me talk to her. Let me see if I can help give her some solutions. Uh, so I, I've been literally looking for you for, for my life this entire time. What's the website? How can people get a hold of you and contact you? Yeah, my website is www.lindsay-dalton.com. Lindsay with an E. e. Yes. I'd ask her to just making sure, but we'll put the uh, the description to her and the link in the comments below through there. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about and go through? Oh, can I just say something really quick you about can. SSRIs? Totally. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all here. I'm all ears. Oh, all man. Ears. SSRIs. I think there's such a misconception. Um, so let's say let's say what SSRIs. Oh, okay. Time. Sorry. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Which are commonly known as? Uh, they're antidepressants. Okay. They can go. also help with anxiety. So... The misconception is that these medications increase your body's serotonin. Okay. They don't. That's not at all what they do. Okay. They so serotonin is your like feel happy. Have feel happy hormone. Yes. yes your neurotransmitter. Okay. Yep. Yep. So it what these medications do is they leave more serotonin available in the synapse of the neurons for them to act on the receptor. When they act on the receptor, you feel happy. Okay. So they're just leaving more serotonin in the synapse. Our bodies are very smart. So you're taking these medications for a month or two or longer, and all of a sudden your body starts stopping the production of serotonin. You're no longer making as much serotonin. Yeah, so your so body's now, like, if, you're, if, you don't, if you're not going to use it, I'm not going to make it, right? Exactly. Yeah. And now you're stuck taking these medications because you try to go off of them and bam, you're hurting. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like the movie Trolls, but it's like grumbly, like angry people. Mm -hmm. like kids and you do too. Yep. That's what it feels like. I, I know a lot of people who have tried and they're like, I can't, you know, I can't, my body's just, I'm, I'm unhappy. I'm like really sad. You become like manic depressive. Same thing with like Adderall withdrawal. Um, I don't know if that's a similar pathway or not, but I, my brother was on Adderall for a long time. And if he ran out for a day, he wasn't like a functioning human being. Like he oh, had yeah. a lot of problems with it. So, so a lot of people they they get on these antidepressants, SSRIs. I know there's some other ones as well. Um, what should their goal be? Like, if you're if you're ever taking one, like, is there a timeline where like it's safe to use? Should you should you never ever be looking for those things? Or is there like, hey, if you have a crisis going on, you this thing shouldn't be. I've I've read that like if it's if you do it for longer than a year. That it can be very, very difficult to wean yourself off of because your body literally downregulates its own neurotransmitter. It doesn't make serotonin anymore. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, there's definitely a time and place for these medications for sure because obviously mental illness is a problem. Yeah. So there's definitely a time and place for them. Um, but I think cognitive therapy can really help journaling, mindset. Just mm -hmm. any kind of mindfulness practice, gratitude. There's so much that happens in our minds and mm -hmm. our bodies, our actual physiology. So much changes just because of our thoughts and our emotions. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. I mean, our bodies can change our thoughts. Our thoughts can change our bodies. It's a two-way street. Yeah. So, I definitely think that they are necessary in some cases, but you have to work to get your mind right there's also other root causes for mm -hmm. feeling anxious and depressed that you can work to find out and yeah. fix. And yeah. there are safe ways to get off these medications with, with supplementation. Right, right. So, so do you feel like oftentimes people kind of jump the gun on it early on? Or maybe, or maybe people go in and <clears throat> they're demanding. And so the doctors are like, okay, I'll just give you one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. but, but they skip this whole process of, yeah, counseling 
get help. You know what I mean? Work on it. I, gut health as well. You know, whenever you're stressed, your body's designed when you're stressed to crave sugar because it's an instantaneous fuel. So if you're stressed, your body's in that fight or flight state. You know, in a big portion of serotonin and dopamine production, they're actually made in your gut. Oh, and so, yes. Yeah, it's like you can't just expect one thing to change. It's not like I colored a picture of a kitty and therefore I'm happy again. It's, you know what I mean? You have to look at this whole systemic approach to wellness that we need more than just one thing. We've got to be doing a lot of these things right. Diet, nutrition, exercise, proper neurological function. You know, we see people who are in chronic pain all the time. So their spine's been shifted out of alignment for years. They're in such chronic pain. Their body's in like this chronic fight or flight state. Mm -hmm. They can't adjust food. They don't sleep well. And again, it's like, it's not that the, the pain reliever is fixing the cause. It's just band-aiding them. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd never have a sprained ankle and try to run a 5K and take a bunch of aspirin before and think you'd make your ankle better. You're going to hurt it worse. And that's one of the things people do is that it, the band-aid isn't just masking it. It's allowing these underlying problems to develop and progress and progress. And I think what's happening now is people are starting to wake up. I think definitely with what's going on in the world right now, people are starting to wake up and say, man, that is not the lifestyle I want. You know, if anything that we've learned in the last five months is no matter which way you think on everything that's going on in the world right now, they've said your health is important because if not, they wouldn't shut the world down for this. Our health is the most important thing. It's the best investment you can make. And I think for people, a lot of them are waking up. People like you in their life is going to really help them make this dramatic change through there. Yeah. Um, any other drugs, we hit the SSRIs. We talked a little bit about statin medications. I'd love to talk about blood pressure medications. If okay. you can give some, some thoughts on that because that's one of the most common problems we see. I see patients come in. I know the research that pain in your spine, neck misalignment can raise your blood pressure 18 to 20 points. I know a bad diet can. Um, if people are on these, I think that's like one of the, the easiest medications for people to, to reduce their need for. But can you talk a minute? Why would you even get on a blood pressure med medication in the beginning before starting these things? Are there certain scenarios in which you need to take them or consult with your doctor? Are there rare scenarios where you've got to take them long term? Any thoughts on that? So I think, again, like doctors just diagnose with someone with hyperten or hypertension and then they just slap a drug on it. That's just what they so do. Much more than that. I mean, <laughs> I wish I could tell I'm you like that trying they to were. so much better. And I'm like trying to say, well, maybe, maybe there's something else. No, like you go in, you get what, two or three tests? Where you have high blood pressure, mm -hmm. which you know there's white coat syndrome. Oh yeah, right. People oh are yeah. Of doctors or what have you. So. So the first line therapy is going to be a diuretic. Mm -hmm. Generally, it's like hydrochlorothiazide. Okay. These diuretics. So if you have high blood pressure, they're giving you a water pill, something that yes. like makes you. Yeah, okay. it's going to make you go to the bathroom. You're going to waste water. So these medications also waste electrolytes. Yeah. What goes down is our sodium. When our sodium goes down, our potassium is going to follow. Potassium okay. is crucial for relaxing our blood vessels. Okay. So if you don't have enough potassium, you're not going to your blood vessels are not going to be relaxed. So it's like this vicious cycle. You're not going to be able to relax your blood vessels and decrease your blood pressure. Okay. Because Let's you're see. taking this medication. Yeah, cuz you don't have the sodium, you don't have you're like losing electrolytes mm -hmm. literally. So you're also going to feel cranky and agitated and have all those other issues. Mm -hmm. So you do a diuretic and then that doesn't work. And then the next step is? Uh, usually like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, lisinopril, losartan, okay. those types. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you get on that. And if you don't change the thing that caused it in the first place. Right. I mean, they're going to start increasing your dose. Maybe they'll slap a third one on there. Yes. Okay. So ACE inhibitor next. And then, yes, yeah, it's... it's it's you're on it forever. Oh yeah. And so when you're on a blood pressure medication, what are some of the side effects of it? Like if you're taking hardcore things that don't allow your blood pressure to go up, like the ACE inhibitors, for example, what happens to your athletic performance? What happens to your capability to, to you know what I mean? Yeah. Go out and get great cardiovascular exercise. Does it affect that? Absolutely. Um, beta blockers are notorious for causing sedation, malaise. Okay. So you're going to be tired. You're not going to feel like exercising or going oh. for a walk. Yeah. It's it's just this vicious cycle. They yeah. they can contribute to depression. Yeah. And all sorts of different things. I mean, it's just a, it's a vicious cycle. And then yeah. you come into your doctor and your new complaint is that you're tired. Yeah. So they're going to give you another medication. Right. <laughs> they're going to help this side and now we're going to go that side. I mean, you can see how this becomes such a such a bad problem so yeah. fast. And I guess, I guess always coming back to it, it's, you know, when they say when diet, exercise and lifestyle change doesn't work, well, that very rarely doesn't work. 
So something like our clinic, as far as helping people, something like you helping people with that, I think is so important as a, as a place to start. You know what I mean? You don't want to sit there and just mask and bandage for your whole entire life. And then when you're, you know, on 10 medications and have diabetes and all these problems decide to change. I think it starts when you're young, yeah. educating your kids, educating yourself and working with those things. Yeah. Cool. Any closing thoughts? I don't have any. We're going to do more of these for <laughs> sure. So, so um, hope you guys enjoyed this. If you have any uh, questions or comments, leave them below. Um, if you want to send us a message uh, with any concerns or you want to want to reach us, uh, www.riversidefamilychiro.com or you can speak with Dr. Lindsay at www.lindsay with an E dash Dalton.com. Um, hope you guys enjoyed this. We'll be doing more in the future. Will you be back? Of course. Yes. <laughs> I'm so excited for it. So we've got a lot to cover. Really, at the end of the day, we want you guys to be your absolute best in health. And so we hope this helps you on your journey.